Hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our On Top of Tax webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking to you about transfer pricing, navigating a changing world and feedback on our recent TP Mines International Conference. We'll be talking about some of the policy and headline themes that came out of the conference as well as highlighting some of the sessions that we as BDO ran at that event. We'll be talking to you about some transfer pricing perspectives across um, the UK, Europe, Asia Pacific and the US. We will talk to you about uh, value chain analysis and the telling and the understanding of the value creation story. And finally, we will also take you through some of the survey results that we ran for the attendees at the event and, and some of our thoughts on the actions that our clients um, may be in a position to, to take in response to some of that. So who have you got with you today from the BDO site? My name is Paul Daly and I am a transfer pricing partner. I lead our practice here in the UK and I am joined by one of my colleagues, Ken Almond, who I will let introduce himself as well. Hello, my name is Ken Armand. I'm a transfer pricing partner here at BDO. Uh, I've worked in transfer pricing for over 20 years. Uh, first of all at uh, HM Revenue and Customs in the UK, uh, then in the Big Four and now at BDO. And I help clients across all sectors uh, to devise and implement transfer pricing strategies, uh, defend audits and put in place the right planning and compliance strategies. Great, thank you Ken. So Ken and I will be taking you through the session today. Um, as we go through the session, if you did have any questions, then please do ask them through the app and we will be picking them up here. And when we um, have opportunity at the end of the session, we will deal with those. If there are questions that we run out of time to answer, then we will follow those up um, individually and send around a response as well to, to make sure that we've covered those off. Okay, so let's get on with the session. So the first topic on the agenda was the feedback from TP Mines International 2019. So for those of you who are not familiar with TP Mines, um, it's the world's um, leading independent trans pricing conference that we in BDO have the uh, privilege of being sponsors of. So in the UK, uh, we are gold sponsors of TP Mines International. And TP Mines run a series of regional events as well. And we are lead sponsors in the US and Australia. And we think it's a fantastic event that brings together many transfer pricing practitioners from across the world, um, both here in London, but also in the other events. And those participants include tax authorities, uh, practitioners, in-house transfer pricing leaders, uh, many policy makers. So in March, we had almost 500 delegates at TP Mines International. And the two days were very filled with um, some excellent discussion across a, a range of um, policy and theme headlines and also some deeper dives into some technical matters. So we've summarized for you some of the policy and theme headlines and then we'll also talk a little bit about some of the, the BDO sessions that we ran. So what was I think very evident from the conference was the continued importance of transfer pricing. And there was a wealth of debate on, on the key global issues. We're seeing the world post BEPS continuing to evolve and navigating the increased complexity has become ever more important. So the BEPS initiative uh, back in 2015 signaled a huge change for transfer pricing and there has been no let up in that pace of change. So whilst we might have hoped for a period of relative calm, whilst the BEPS initiatives embedded themselves and we worked our way through the implications of the initiative, what has happened has really been 
the development of new areas of policy, the arising of new areas of uncertainty, and one of the drivers of that has really been the digital economy and how is it that we deal with the challenges of the digital economy for the purposes of international um, taxation. There's been limited consensus thus far on the, the policies related to the digital economy um, across a, a number of territories. And transfer pricing is involved in, in that and becoming increasingly politicised as the conversation really widens to taxing rights, the economic substance of businesses and how those are measured, and how it is that anti-avoidance um, will feature in the landscape. And all of this played a part in the keynote debates within the conference hall. And there was a notable change in tone from years gone by where the debate may have been within the realm of transfer pricing and, and particular policy developments within transfer pricing. Latterly and, and this year, the debate became more what is transfer pricing's role within that wider debate. So the digital economy, as said, has driven a great deal of the um, developments um, post bets, and this was uh, approached in a number of sessions from a, a number of angles, and how to deal with the, the challenges being forefront of mind. And whilst many territories um, we could see as our multilateral solution, uh, backed, organised by the OECD the risk of a slow global consensus on that is leading to the rise of potential unilateral measures and more fragmentation and uncertainty in the short term. And that, as a topic, was one of uh, concern uh, aired in, in many sessions. Digitalization was not only limited to discussion for the wider economy, but also um, closer to home, how it is that tax and transfer pricing professionals are using technology in the day-to-day -day job. So post BEPS, we have seen the transfer pricing compliance burden continue to increase for multinationals. And we are seeing a range of solutions being developed to help automate the process around documentation, around creating invoices to implement transactions. And whilst it's clear that the technology is still in this formative stage and is not a substitute for well thought out policy design and documentation, it's clear that the desire for the cost efficiency and the greater potential for automation by technology means that this is a trend we will continue um, to see and we will expect to play a much bigger role in the coming years um, within the realm of transfer pricing and other areas of international tax. So we had some great keynotes from some of the policymakers at the conference. And one of the interesting policy developments that was aired relates to a program from the OECD called the International Compliance Assurance Program, ICAP, which aims to give a coordinated view on some multinationals' risk profile and establishing whether they could be considered as low risk for transfer pricing purposes. And whilst this may not offer as concrete a legal assurance as an APA or a MAP, it is viewed as uh, an effective way to risk assess and then focus the energies on the right cases um, for tax administrations and also as a way to engage with taxpayers and give them a view as to the acceptability of their transfer pricing arrangements. And indeed, since the TP Mines conference um, on the 19th and 20th, the OECD released additional details about the ICAP and the move to the ICAP 2.0 and the development of the thinking around uh, the voluntary program for multinationals to um, cooperatively risk assess and form a view on the assurance process, the output being a potential view from uh, tax authorities on a multilateral basis as to the risk profile of the 
um, transfer pricing arrangements being examined. So this, I think, is an area of great potential, and I'm sure we will see um, this feature um, in the coming months and years. So on the BDO side, we, over the two days, uh, ran some key sessions for participants. So Ken, um, in a moment, will talk about uh, transfer pricing perspectives across the UK, Europe, Australia, uh, Germany. We entered into uh, a very interesting and great debate as to the role of the arm's length principle post bets particularly in light of the challenges of the digital economy. And I um, held a session around value chain analysis and the importance of understanding and telling a group's value creation story. And I will be taking you through that um, a little bit later on in the webinar. So at this point, I will hand over to Ken, who will take us through some transfer pricing perspectives from some of the key territories. Thank you, Paul. The opening session at the, the CP Minds event was a, a breakfast briefing, and the idea was to give the, the delegates at the conference an insight into what is happening around the world uh, in terms of transfer pricing developments, uh, what tax authorities are doing, uh, what policymakers are doing, and what we are seeing on the ground. So we flew in. Uh, transfer pricing leaders from Europe, from the Americas, and from Australia uh, in order to provide that insight. The overriding message um, that is being received from around the world is a significant increase in compliance burden. This message is being delivered by business, by the policy makers, and by our colleagues. It's been driven by increased regulation, by the BEPS program and challenges from tax authorities. What is clear is that compliance is no longer simply an issue for the finance department, it's an issue for the boardroom. So let's have a look at the United Kingdom. It's fair to say that the compliance burden has increased in the United Kingdom as well as in other countries. And the reasons for this are as follows. First of all, uh, HM Revenue and Customs are becoming more aggressive in their use of investigation powers and penalties. They are recruiting more specialists and becoming um, more aggressive in terms of their inquiries and how they are gathering information. They have also created and expanded their compliance teams. They are focusing in particular on the quality of compliance documentation. So they're no longer accepting transfer pricing reports at face value, but anecdotally, they are challenging facts and assumptions in those reports. They have also recruited economists and sector specialists to help them to understand uh, and provide insight into different, uh, different industries and different types of transactions. It's also fair to say that other BEPS-related but non-transfer pricing legislation is causing concerns to business in the UK. These include things like anti-hybrid rules, interest restriction rules, um, which are UK, uh, UK specific, but arising out of the, the BEPS program, but also new legislation in other countries such as the economic substance rules that are being introduced in various jurisdictions around the world. Back in the UK, a new profit diversion compliance facility has been launched by HMRC to encourage taxpayers to comply with the diverted profits tax. This facility is designed to help multinationals to review their arrangements that might fall within the diverted profits tax and if necessary to make a report to HMRC. This is important for transfer pricing because uh, the diverted profits tax is fundamentally uh, concerned with transfer pricing and economic substance and value creation and therefore there is a clear read across between the two. Country by country reports are also being used by HMRC for risk assessing purposes 
and it is clear that where profits are arising in low tax territories, um, the risk rating of taxpayers is increasing and is leading to inquiries. So in summary, the UK compliance environment is becoming more demanding than in recent years, and the quality of compliance policies and documentation needs to reflect this. Businesses can't simply um, hide behind uh, dated and high-level transfer pricing documentation. So what's happening in Europe? There's no big tax reforms on the agenda, but countries in general are instead focusing on implementing the BEPS program. And of course, the taxation of the digital economy is a very topical area of debate, as we will see later. Generally, countries are focusing on implementing country-by-country -country reporting, master files, and local files. This is happening across Europe. But we are also seeing specific legislation in various countries. So, for example, in the Netherlands, there's a decree on the cost contribution agreements. There's also a decree in Germany uh, with regards to tax compliance management systems. And across Europe, we are seeing a great focus by tax authorities on BEPS-related issues uh, relating to IP transactions and also profit split and the profits of routine entities um, and how they are calculated and documented. In addition, we are also seeing lots of inquiries into services, management services, um, which is, has always been a favourite of tax authorities and is showing no signs of relenting. So what's happening in 2019 and the future? In Germany, there are cases going through the courts about intercompany financing, which are clearly going to have an impact on transfer pricing uh, transactions with that country. In the UK, we have uh, Brexit, which is still a, a very hot political issue. Um, but from a transfer pricing perspective, we are seeing businesses review their supply chains. Uh, some of them are setting up new offices or distribution entities in EU states, but it's fair to say there is still a significant amount of uncertainty. Um, on a broader scale, we have mandatory disclosure rules, which are due to apply from the 1st of July 2020. Um, these will require intermediaries and relevant taxpayers to disclose information on reportable cross-border arrangements which are essentially aggressive tax planning arrangements, and also digital service tax. The aim is to have a multilateral consensus by 2020, but this is clearly an a important political issue, and we may see unilateral action before that date. Asia Pacific, as with the rest of the world, Compliance is becoming ever more important in this region. There has been a noticeable increase in the number of countries introducing transfer pricing rules and recruiting specialist staff. We have definitely seen uh, an uptick in terms of the number and scale of transfer pricing inquiries across a number of countries. So it's not just the uh, developed transfer pricing jurisdictions such as Australia. We are seeing new rules and inquiries in many countries, such as uh, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, and the Philippines. Some countries have formally introduced uh, BEPS Action 13 documentation rules, for example, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Japan. And as I just mentioned, they haven't just introduced these rules, they are implementing um, or they are challenging taxpayers to comply with them. We, we are already seeing um, engagements um, and inquiries in Singapore, for example, where the rules are relatively new, but the tax authorities are taking action to ensure they are being complied with. And as a result, uh, taxpayers are becoming increasingly aware of this changing compliance environment 
and are taking steps to ensure that they are putting the right documentation in place. The type of transactions that are being investigated by the authorities uh, typically include management services, royalties and intercompany loans. Um, but we are also seeing certain product transactions as well that are being looked into. Australia is worth a special mention. The uh, Australian Tax Office is halfway through their so-called Top 1000 program. That is all companies with turnover uh, in Australian dollars greater than 250 million are being reviewed from a transfer pricing perspective. So they're halfway through that program. Um, the ATO show no signs of slowing down in terms of their challenges uh, on transfer pricing. Also in Australia, there has been the introduction of IFRS 23, which requires Australian entities to reserve any transfer pricing risks. That's as of January 2019. That is quite a key development and one which um, businesses need to be well aware of. The Americas. What, what, we, what we see in, in America is a large diversity of different regimes and uh, legislation and compliance. For example, in Canada, we have seen a significant spike in transfer pricing audits, adjustments and penalties. In the US, we are seeing the impact of tariffs on Chinese imports, causing businesses to change or consider changing their supply chains. Clearly, um, politics is having an impact uh, in terms of such uh, trade wars, and also US tax reform, and the reduction in particular in US tax rates is further considering multinationals to reconsider their uh, tax structures, supply chains, and their pricing. One interesting point about the US and Canada is that they have not adopted the master file uh, rules, which arose out of uh, BEPS recommendations. However, many businesses are compiling them or versions of them. And the reason for this is that such businesses will typically have to compile a master file for other jurisdictions and therefore um, compile one for the US and Canada too. One, one significant debate that is happening though is the extent um, to which, or the, the detail which should be included in such master files. Uh, we see some which are maybe 10 or 12 pages long, we see others that are hundreds of pages long. And given the, the lack of specific guidance from the OECD as to um, the depth of content that's required, this is a, a debate that is, is raging uh, and we are seeing it particularly in, in the US and Canada. Further south, um, in Latin America, a key issue is Brazil, and Brazil is seeking to become a member of the OECD under political pressure to introduce the arm's length principle into its transfer pricing legislation. Uh, the country has uh, long been known for having uh, transfer pricing rules which are not OECD compliance and it would be very helpful for many businesses if they were to become a member of the OECD and to uh, revise their transfer pricing legislation accordingly. BEPS adoption is mixed in Latin America but a number of countries have signed up to exchange country by country reports. It's too early to determine the impact of this uh, in terms of audit or risk assessing by tax authorities, but we would expect that it will have an impact um, in years to come. Okay, great. Cool. Thanks very much. So uh, a range of views there from across the, uh, across the globe. But uh, I think one thing that comes out is that compliance is tightening up everywhere. 
And, and this next session will talk to you about a very important part of, of transfer pricing, which um, will be important for a number of reasons, not least um, meeting the compliance obligations, and that is value chain analysis. And I'll be a bit more specific about what I mean by value chain analysis, because this is a relatively widely drawn term. So by value chain analysis in this context, I mean the importance of understanding and telling the value creation story. And it's really uh, a view of two parts. So the first part is the, the understanding part, and we'll take you through why does there need to be an understanding, how do we form that understanding. And the second part is then telling the value creation story. What is the form of the telling of that story for transpricing purposes, but also what are the important considerations in how you go about telling that? So, understanding the value creation story. Why do we need to understand that story? Well, if I take us back to BEPS, if I take us back specifically to BEPS actions 8 to 10, we can see the headlines as to why we need to understand the value creation story when we look at the front cover even of the Action 8 to 10 report, which has the intent of aligning transfer pricing outcomes with value creation. And so in headline terms, if we don't understand the value creation, we are going to find it difficult to align the transfer pricing outcomes. So the guidance in Actions 8 to 10 collectively look to ensure a number of things that we'll all now be familiar with as transfer pricing practitioners. So Actions 8 to 10 look to ensure the actual business transactions uh, undertaken are identified and the transfer pricing is not based on contractual arrangements that do not reflect economic reality. And contractual allocations of risk only respected when they're supported by actual decision making capital without functionality, generating no more than a risk free return, ensuring no premium returns be allocated to cash boxes without relevant substance. And tax administrations may disregard transactions when the exceptional circumstances of commercial rationality apply. And in summary, in combination, the changes make a key contribution to aligning transfer pricing outcomes with the value creating activities performed by the members of multinational enterprise group. So that was really at the heart of Actions 8 to 10, and arguably, Actions 8 to 10 were at the heart of BEPS for transfer pricing. And of course, the thinking continues to move on, and the foundations of Actions 8 to 10 will be built upon, but I just wanted to take us back for a moment to roots, the need to understand the, the value creation story. So, how do we get into that value creation story? So number one, it's establishing the basis of the value creation. Secondly, it's then establishing the relationship between functions, assets, risks, and that value creation. So in the next few slides, I will take you through some of the references in the OECD guidelines, the 2017 version, and walk through some of the framing of that story from a transfer pricing perspective. So all stories have a beginning, and the beginning of our story is in para 134 of the OECD guidelines which really sets out the big picture as to the process of identifying the commercial financial relationships between the associated enterprises and the conditions and economically relevant circumstances attaching to those relations, which requires a broad-based understanding of the industry sector in which the group operates and of the factors affecting the performance of any business operating in that sector. The understanding is derived from an overview of the group, which outlines how that group responds to the factors affecting performance in the sector, including its business strategies, markets, products, its supply chain, and the key functions performed, material assets used, and important risks assumed. 
So functions, assets, and risks are the building blocks of transfer pricing analysis. And some of what I've just set out there, or from the OECD guidelines, are the economically relevant circumstances, or otherwise known as comparability factors. So transfer pricing is based around comparison, comparing of a transaction between connected parties with those transactions and outcomes as between unconnected parties. And a key way of doing that is examining the functions, assets, and risks to make that comparison. So Para 136 starts us on that journey of working through functions, assets, and risks. And the key point to note here is right at the beginning, we are needing to understand the relation functions, assets, and risks, the wider generation of value by the multinational group to which the parties belong, and the circumstances surrounding transaction and industry practices. So it's that relationship with the generation of value that gives the functions, assets, and risks the meaning from a transfer pricing perspective. In particular, when we look at functions, we need to understand how that value is generated by the group as a whole, the interdependencies of the functions between the associated enterprises, and the contribution that the associated enterprises make to that value creation. So again, this guidance is tied to that notion of underlying value creation. It is the thing that makes sense of all of the analysis that we create from a transfer pricing perspective. So this relationship doesn't end with functions. There is also a very important relationship for assets, and specifically intangible assets. So Para 6.3 tells us that in cases involving the use or transfer of intangibles, it is especially important to ground functional analysis on an understanding of the global business and the manner in which intangibles are used to add or create value across the entire supply chain. And within that context, there are some very important considerations. And one of the, the key messages from the guidelines is that not all intangibles deserve compensation separate from the required payment for goods or services that those intangibles um, may enable. And how you get to the decision as to whether there is a, a separate compensation, and if so, what is that compensation, um, needs to be explored through the lens of the relationship with value. So would a transfer of the intangible be compensated by an independent party. The extent of legal protection may affect that value. The intangible might not feature on the balance sheet, but actually is used in the creation of significant economic value. And the guidelines are at pains to reflect that exploitation of intangibles can account for a larger or small part of multinationals value creation. Not all intangibles are created equal in value terms. So understanding the relationship with value creation is the means by which you can then move through to how do we view this from a transfer pricing perspective. Risk is the third building block of the functional analysis after the functions and assets. In power 173, directs us to the determination of the economic significance of risk and how the risk may affect the pricing of the transaction between associated enterprises. And that this is part of a broader functional analysis of how value is created by the multinational group. So if we think of risk as the effect of uncertainty on the objectives of the business, we can only judge the significance of that risk in the context of how the business creates value. So risk may exist, but if it does not relate to how 
a business significantly creates value, then it may not be an important risk for transfer pricing purposes. And risk can be a difficult area to define and analyze. And there is no tick list of risks, but the OECD have framed certain types of risk that we see in many groups. But the guidance is there very much to say, make a judgment as to how this risk relates to value creation. So how do we work through that relationship? Once we've established, well, what is the value creation? How do we marry up the functions, assets, risks, and that value creation? Well, there are now a number of more granular techniques that have come about following the updates to transpricing post BEPS. We have some very important frameworks, analytical frameworks that exist within the guidelines themselves. And businesses are also creating and adapting other organizational mapping techniques to create a good, robust, and granular view of the relationship. So DEMPI, Development, Enhancement, Maintenance, Protection, Exploitation of Intangible Assets is now a very important feature in transfer pricing analysis. And within DEMPI, certain important functions of special significance which may be particularly deserving of a share of the value that IP creates. The analytical framework to help assess who really is the economic owner of the IP is also the same as the framework used to assess who really controls a risk and how is it that you align the control of risk with the assumption of risk and the financial capacity to bear the risk. But much of the link really is turning into a link between the people and what they do, and what they use, and the risks that they control. And so use of organizational mapping techniques is becoming increasingly popular. So RACI, uh, Responsible, Accountable, Consulted and Informed Mapping, is something that is enjoying um, some developments uh, within transfer pricing analysis. And this enables a, a very detailed view as to within a function who really is accountable or uh, a business process who is responsible, who is consulted and informed, and that allows a weighting of that um, emphasis, and it also allows a very clear articulation of who is doing what, and much of that will drive um, the, the transfer pricing analysis that follows. So that's why, um, or at least a flavor of why, we need to understand the value creation story from a transfer pricing perspective. The next part is then the effective telling of that value creation story. And for a business, the value creation story is already being told. The business is busy telling the world about itself, and it will do that through annual reports, through its 10Ks. And that version of the story is usually a carefully created and curated version of the story and forms an important part of how a business advertises itself, how it creates value, what makes it different, distinct, valuable. However, there is another story that the business is telling the world in a more unstructured and uncontrolled manner, and that is the story being told through social media by the employees of the business. And it's now increasingly common practice, certainly in the UK, upon a transfer pricing audit for the tax authority to examine social media, to look at the individuals in particular functions, and to contrast their version of the story with the business's official version of the story. The business is telling itself its story. So all businesses will be communicating all of the time internally in the way that that communication is conducted internally is also very important. And those internal communications will often be requested um, on a transpricing inquiry. But the world is also telling the business uh, what creates value. There'll be press reports, 
analyst reports, reputation. And a combination of those three tellings mean that the story is already out there. So when we think about telling the trans pricing story, it's almost a retelling of the story. But what's the particular form? Well, we have some stipulation as to how we need to tell the, the trans pricing version of the value creation story as a result of action 13 of BEPS and the recommendation on the common approach of master file, local file, CBCR. So in the master file, um, we've pulled here some of the guidance from the annex as to what is contained within a master file. And you'll see that nowhere in those words are tell us about the value chain. There is indeed a stipulation to tell us about the supply chain. But the value chain for these purposes is really a combination of setting out the important drives of business profit, so what creates value in the group, and then the brief written functional analysis describing the principal contributions to the value creation by individual entities within the group, i.e. the key functions performed, important risks assumed, and important assets used. So that's the master file version of the value creation story. And Para 134, which we talked about earlier on, is the setting out of that broad-based industry understanding also. So when we move into the local file, the value chain story is there as well. So there is the detailed functional analysis, and critically, how it relates to value creation. What are the economically relevant characteristics? And that those economically relevant characteristics, that relationship between functions, assets, risks, and the value creation should be included as part of the local file. So sometimes when I have discussions, around value chain, the value creation story, there's an automatic assumption that it's really a master file story, but I think the story is also very, very importantly told as well in the local file. So we also see some groups assembling what we've termed here defence documentation, and by this we mean a fuller narrative of the value creation story, created contemporaneously, but not necessarily in a form that is required the master file or local file. And the importance of doing that is that what seems very clear at the time may well be less easily remembered or less clear years after the event when that recording might be needed uh, as a result of questions or the opening of an inquiry. So what's important about the telling of the story? And I think the view here would be consistency. Consistency is absolutely fundamental, and there are at least three levels of consistency. So the first is that the story should be consistent across the trans pricing analysis group-wide. As we've been exploring, all of the trans pricing analysis is really related to the group's value creation. And so that story um, should be present in all of the trans pricing analysis across the group. Country by country reporting has been a really important development. And country by country reports tell their own story. And a tax authority, um, a reader of a country by country report, will form their own view of the story that it tells. So it's very important to be able to contextualize that country by country report to explain what it means. Otherwise, someone else may put meaning into it. And the third point of consistency is that consistency with the story that the business is already telling. And inconsistencies in the story are a very quick way for an analysis to unravel. So that is the understanding of and the telling of the value creation story. We're now going to move our focus back to the survey that we um, undertook at TP Mines, and I'm going to hand over to Ken to take us through some of the headline findings from that. Thank you, Paul. So you've heard what we've got to say. Let's hear what the attendees at the conference had to say. And we managed to survey a significant uh, number of them. 
And some of the results are quite, quite staggering, I think. First of all, compliance burden. The compliance burden of transfer pricing documentation and country-by-country -country reporting is the biggest transfer pricing challenge faced by the respondents to the survey. Almost 60% put the compliance burden at the top of their list. And I think there are two key issues here. First of all, there are now more countries requ requiring documentation. And secondly, post BEPS, the um, form of documentation and the level of detail that is required has increased. Also, uh, I think this is quite a staggering statistic, almost 50% of organizations who responded said that they intend to increase their in-house transfer pricing capability in the short to medium term. Uh, that's, that's, that's a very high number, 50%, half of organizations feel they need to uh, engage more resource in order to meet their uh, upcoming requirements. What, what is interesting here is, is that transfer pricing is a very specialist area and it's one thing to need more resource, but it's another to actually go out into the market and find uh, appropriate resource. So I think um, a lack of transfer pricing uh, professionals and specialists is, is a, a key concern as well for many businesses. Only 12% of respondents find implementation of transfer pricing policies straightforward, uh, with 20% or more than 20% considering it always to be a problem. This is not a surprise to us. What we see on many occasions is that many businesses will um, commission a report or a transfer pricing policy, but then they will struggle to implement it. And if ever challenged, um, a failure to implement transfer pricing properly is, is um, something which tax authorities are always on the lookout for because it's one thing having uh, a nice report, but if it's not implemented, then that report is, is fairly worthless. The next point was around the use of technology. And we have seen a, a significant increase in recent years on the use of transfer pricing uh, technology for compliance purposes. But according to the survey, 40% of respondents are not yet making use of such technology. That is, a, that is a significant proportion and one which we would expect to see falling in years to come. Almost two thirds of respondents are preparing documentation for all their territories in which transfer pricing rules apply, with only 5% waiting for a tax inquiry before preparing documentation. Uh, this is eminently sensible given that if you wait for an inquiry, then in many uh, situations that will be too late and you significantly increase the risk uh, of increased uh, tax liabilities, penalties, interest, management time, advisors fees, um, all of the, the negatives which would be eradicated or certainly reduced if a transfer pricing document was put in place on a more timely basis. Finally, organizations have become proactive in responding to the changing landscape when it, become, when it comes to intangible property. And Paul's already discussed uh, DEMPI. Almost 80% of respondents have reviewed the transfer pricing treatment of group intangibles in line with BEPS guidance, which um, again seems uh, very sensible given the changes that have occurred in the last few years. So what do we think that businesses should be doing uh, in response to these changes and these responses that we've been seeing? I think the first <coughs> overall point is that they shouldn't be looking at compliance and planning in isolation. The two are fundamentally linked and it's a, an error usually <clears throat> to look at one uh, and not the other. First of all, groups need to review their transfer pricing policies on a regular basis. It's no longer effective to uh, review transfer pricing every three or five years. For most groups, uh, it needs to be done at least on an annual basis, not least because master files need updating every year and a failure to review a master file um, will effectively be a failure uh, on the compliance strategy. 
also consider making use of granular transfer pricing tools. We've already mentioned value chain analysis. This will help you to understand value creation in the group. Um, it'll help you to apply risk frameworks within the OECD guidelines and, and DEMPI framework. And uh, this will help in terms of analysis uh, on a profit contribution of value built IP within the group. You also need to document transfer pricing because there's no point having a solid defendable strategy if it is not documented correctly. So a documentation process is needed which will deliver a robust and maintainable approach to compliance documentation and will ensure that the group meets minimum local compliance requirements um, whilst ensuring a consistent approach to transfer pricing in the face of tax audits and inquiries. And it's worth saying here that we have seen a very significant increase in tax audits and inquiries uh, across the globe in recent years, uh, particularly in countries that are introducing or updating transfer pricing legislation. We are seeing inquiries in countries that five years ago we would not see any inquiries. So it's important to make sure that the documentation process and strategy is consistent and defendable across the entire group and not just focus on the high risk countries and transactions that might have been the case in the past. Finally, implementation. As we've seen from the survey results, Implementation is, is one of the, the key challenges for businesses. Our advice would be determine transparent and repeatable operational procedures that ensure financial results reflect transfer pricing policies. There's no point having a transfer pricing policy that does not flow through to the financial uh, results. Also, one point which is often overlooked is to ensure that legal contracts and agreements are in place between related parties within a group that reflect the underlying facts. Uh, the legal form, form should, of course, reflect economic substance. This is a particularly important area because one of the first uh, documents or items that tax authorities will ask for in the case of an audit are the legal agreements. And if you don't have them, then straight away you are on the back foot in terms of defending your transfer pricing. So legal agreements now form a key part of your transfer pricing documentation strategy. Great. Thank you, Ken. And uh, our survey uh, is still able to be completed, so we'll share a link with you, and please do have your say um, and share your views on uh, that as well. So, we have um, taken you through some of the highlights of um, TP Mines International and some of the themes that we saw emerging. And what struck me was the, both the level of attendance at TP Mines, almost 500 people, but also the energy in the room and the appetite to debate and to establish a way of working through the increased complexity we're facing in the international tax environment. And it's clear that BEPS was just the beginning of a fundamental overhaul of how we think about tax internationally and also the tools and techniques available to us. On the back of BEPS, um, in light of the increasing political, media and economic focus around international tax, compliance is tightening and it's tightening across the board. And, and with that comes the um, risk of controversy between taxpayers and tax authorities and indeed between tax authorities and so we are seeing an increased appetite for ways of um, working through that controversy and, and, and a way of forming a view of risk to make sure that attention is focused in, in preserving cases. We're also seeing the increase in the sophistication of the tools and techniques that transfer pricing practitioners are using. And that is driving an increased investment in processes, technology enabled or not, and policy development and compliance management in the form of documentation and assurance around processes to result in 
an appropriate transfer pricing. Okay, well that's um, it for a scheduled presentation. We're just checking in as to um, questions. I'm not sure we can access those at the moment, so we will um, check with those and then follow up after this uh, webinar. So to say thank you very much for your dialing in and <coughs> attendance, and we will look forward to the opportunity to interact with you again. And please do join um, some of our future webinars. The details are up on the screen. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>